Welcome to the Audible Genius Podcast, where we take a behind the scenes look at being a musician. I'm Joe Hanlon. Today, I'm talking to Steve Morrow, an accomplished sound mixer for film and TV. We'll be talking about the art of recording dialogue and sound during a shoot, which is a fascinatingly complex and uniquely challenging process. And we'll dive into the work Steve has done on films like A Star is Born, Babylon, and La La Land to explore the intricacies of recording live music performances for film. Let's get started. All right, Steve. So you are a sound mixer for film and TV. And when a musician hears the term mixing, they think of a very different thing. So can you tell me what exactly does a sound mixer do in movies and TV? So there's there's obviously a bunch of different sound people on movie and TV. My job is the production sound mixer. So I'm the guy on set recording the actors talking. My The main audio that you hear from me is coming out of the center channel in the movie theater. So that's, you okay. know, voices, dialogue, um, things of that nature. So we're, we're put into the on-location shooting uh, scenario. So mobile mobile recording, everything is, you know, brought in and taken out the same day. Okay. And like, you know, I always obviously known that's a thing that happens in movies, right? Yeah, that's, sure. we, hear, we hear the people. But after having just like random conversations with you about it, I realized just how difficult and complex it is. I mean, like what what's difficult about doing this? What are some of the difficulties? Well, I mean, some, some, you know, a lot of the time, the the louder the location, meaning like closer to the airports, closer to the freeway, just like in real estate, it's cheaper, right? So it's cheaper to film in these noisy environments, not because they're noisy, just because they're near more industrial areas. And so you'll have this beautiful scene of two people sitting on a blanket in a park having a picnic and just off camera, you know, behind the camera is the freeway. And we don't see that as an audience, um, but you may hear it. And so it's our job to really, you know, if we can speak up well in advance and say, you know, there's a noisy freeway there, we shouldn't shoot there. But 90% of the time, they've already picked it, they've already paid for it, you're just going to look and see what you can do about it. Um, so uh-huh. then you deploy different techniques, you can you can radio mic them. Um, you know, you can get a boom nice and close. Most of the time outside now, with uh, multi camera, you know, you're not shooting just one camera at a time, you're shooting, you know, two or three at a time. Um, you tend to use a lot of radio mics and depending on how you mic them and how loud the actor is, that's how quiet the uh, ambience is. So the challenges are that, you know, and then, and then you also have these, uh, like Ford versus Ferrari. If you watch that movie, anytime we're at the, the racetrack, the wind is going like 40 miles an hour, but these guys all have very short haircuts and t-shirts on. So you don't see the wind in frame. You don't see it at all but you have a wind tunnel and you have a little microphone on an actor that you now have to put a big fur ball on so that you can get rid of the wind, but you can't see that in camera because otherwise it ruins the the effect that you're watching a movie. So um, those are some challenges where it's like, it's not super obvious to the audience and, and there's noise all over. And the goal is to just get it as clean as you can. Wow. So if, if the actors say had long hair and it's obvious that there's wind blowing, would you be a little more forgiving? Like you would allow some of the wind sound into the recording? Ish, but not really. I mean, like it would at least uh, let the audience know, hey, there's wind. And so we all are comfortable with that sound, right? Like, okay. if, like I said, like in the park, the audience is watching this, this beautiful, you know, picnic in the park. And it's kind of like, wait, what is going on? And why is there all this noise? You know? Whereas if you turn around the camera and you see uh, the freeway going in the background and they're sitting there talking, then you go, your, your mind automatically goes, okay, I get it. You know, there's a freeway there. Okay. Got it. Okay. So, you know, there's like a little yes. bit of a, you could allow a little bit in there and it's okay. Yeah. It won't confuse the yeah. audience. Okay. Like we, we now, did this, I did this TV show years ago called, it was, it's on Hulu now. It's called <laughs> casual, casual the okay. TV show is called <laughs> casual. Oh my gosh. What a great show. So casual, we shot a lot of the time on a street called Ventura Boulevard and the cinematographer and I had lots of chit chats about it. And Ventura Boulevard is like a main artery in Los Angeles. It's like all the traffic goes through there and you can't close it down. And we were a tiny show, so we didn't have the money to close it down. Um, and a lot of the time you'd shoot on the sidewalk of two people coming out of a restaurant talking and you could frame it where you just see down the sidewalk or you could frame it so you could see the cars driving by. And the cinematographer and I worked together and I said, hey, if you could shoot two cameras, you know, over each person's shoulder so that the edit is going back and forth and it's just real time editing. You don't have to, you know, you're not looking one direction then turning around, looking the other, because every time you do that sound edit, 
it changes the ambience because it's a different time and in, in different space and time in, in life, right? Different uh-huh. cars are by, going by at the same time. And so him and I work together close to get two cameras looking opposite directions at the traffic while the actors are talking at the same time. And then all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the show works perfectly because the actors are talking over the cars, the cars are in the frame, everything makes sense. And so you watch that show and not one line of dialogue was re-recorded in the entire, I think, five seasons, four seasons of that show because we were able to do things like that, where it's like, no, you're on a real street. Let's show the traffic. Because if you show the nice, you know, sidewalk, you know, you have to fix the traffic noise. If you show the traffic, you don't have to fix it. Oh, that's so cool. Eh? You really had yeah. to think about, like, when you're, when you're recording music, like in a studio, you don't have to think about what the listener's seeing. It's pure audio, but you really yep. have to think about what the person's seeing and how they're going to connect audio to that sense, their sight sense. Yes. And also that, by the way, uh, transitions perfectly into why sometimes musicals feel really wrong when you're watching them on TV. So you'll watch, you know, or, you know, a movie about, you know, people singing in a park, but it sounds like they're singing in a recording studio because 90% of the time they are. And so Ah. there's tricks, there's tricks to make that sound more real. Uh, which we've done throughout the years. But when you're doing a musical in the whole world, ambient changes into the sound studio sounds, you know, where you've recorded, pre-recorded all these, these vocals, uh, the audience gets thrown. And that's why musicals are hard to digest sometimes because they just don't seem real. So like you did La La Land, for example. So all the actual music, the vocal recordings that was done in studio. So a a movie like La La Land was kind of 50, 50 Emma Stone or yeah. Emma Stone's, vocals were all recorded uh on set live okay. so like her big audition scene that that's very powerful and her and ryan Gosling, uh you know playing piano in his apartment singing their song together that's all live between the two of them ryan okay. Gosling on like the 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 pier by the ocean that's playback so he's just lip syncing what he pre-recorded okay uh, all of emma stone's roommates you know dancing around the apartment were recorded pre-recorded and then play back and they would they would lip sync it you know okay um so that's that's an example of like it's like a 50 50 you know like emma even emma stone's vocals in the roommate song were sung live on on set because you're able to mix match some of that so the audience doesn't get fully wiped out thinking well this is just a giant music moment you know okay Um, so so by recording the other person on the set, you're getting some of that like real room ambience to mix yeah, in get, with Yeah, you get Emma's... some real room ambience. You get, um, and, and it's really up to post-production too, to be able to blend in some ambient sound from the set, you know, because okay. right. it's really easy to turn a knob off on the set recording and say, no, we have it in pre-record, but you know, that will throw an audience pretty easily nowadays, you know, because okay. we're, all, we're all used to hearing real stuff. So if you, if you have a scene where you recorded the singer in the studio, in order to make it sound like it's in the space they're actually moving in, do you literally just record just some empty, like ambient space and then layer that on top later on? Well, we actually have, there's a couple tech, a couple different techniques you can do. A lot of the time, at least in, in the last couple of years, I've been able to convince a director, let's at least try it live. We have the pre-record. Okay. We can play the pre-record in their ear, you know, so they'll have a little earpiece that looks like a hearing aid. Um, that's, you know, pseudo AM FM ish quality. It's not great, but it's not, Uh it's not terrible. It's enough that they understand the music, uh, and we'll record them live. Now, whether that's used or not, it doesn't really matter because now you have that track of live and, and sometimes it's easy to go from, you know, dialogue, dialogue, first line of vocals in the song all live, and then they can mix in the studio recording and kind of fade out of the live stuff. And then right at the end of the song, fade back into the real vocal on set. And then that tricks the entire audience into thinking the whole thing was live. So you can, you can mix and match. Um, But then there's, there's the reverse, which is like a star is born. All the music, basically all the music in the movie, the actual instrumentation was done in the studio, but all the vocals were done live on set. And then what we would do is we would do an impulse response um, in the venue. And so that is a bunch of sounds. It's basically like, you know, your old car radio that had like church and hall one, hall two, you uh-huh. know, you had the different EQs that you could set. We're, we're generally making, we're basically making a custom version of that on set. So we'll, wow. we'll send tone through the whole house. We'll ring the room and we'll have different microphones and through, you know, a program later, 
we'll pull it all open and say, okay, this is how big the room was. This is how noisy it was. This is how much slap there is. And then you add that EQ, that custom EQ to the pre-recorded music, the instruments. And now all of a sudden, instead of it sounding like it was in a, in a quiet, you know, recording studio, now it sounds like it's in an arena that was custom. So you apply the impulse response to an EQ or a reverb or both? That's right. Yeah, you do it to everything. I mean, oh, you do everything. it to the vocals, you do it to, yeah, you just name it, you do it to everything. Wow. That's interesting because, you know, me and musicians, we use, like in mixing and stuff, we use impulse responses for reverb primarily. Yep. But would you apply to an actual EQ effect and then put that onto everything? Like, what, um, what a- Well, it depends on, I mean, no, basically the, the music is you know, it was pre-recorded and pre-mixed, but you'll take the impulse response and you'll, you'll apply it to the music so that it sounds like it is coming from the venue that you're okay. actually, you know, filming. And is there a specific tool that you use, like a, like a plugin, a software, a piece of software that does that in the end? Uh, we don't on set. What we do okay. is we just record it, let them unzip it later. Right. Got so it. Okay. I, I think it's a verb. What What is the, I'm sure it's a very standard. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of those. Are, yeah, because it's great. Like you said, you can get an actual room. Like it's not a yeah. digital recreation of some kind of room. It's a that literal room imprinted yeah. upon the audio, right? Yeah. And like, you know, Stars Born, we went everywhere. And so we did, we rung the room everywhere. We even rung the room at Coachella, which, you know, if you've ever been in the middle of the desert, we put this pulse out that like, you know, the whole stage started shaking because you start with super low end and you go super high end, right? It's like uh-huh. high frequency. And so stage is shaking. And finally, when it gets all the way to the high end, everybody's plugging their ears and you can hear it bounce off the mountain six miles away, like 12 <laughs> seconds later. It was like, oh my gosh. That's and so we cool. have that reverb and it's just like, you'll never use that for anything other than that scene because it's it's such a ridiculous <laughs> <Right>. distance. <laughs> yeah. So you had to do that. So like at a time when there was no one at Coachella well, early in the morning or something, you had to... No, well, what we did is we filmed Coachella uh in between the the venues or in between uh, the weekends so coachella happens during a weekend so we would film monday through thursday and then friday they would have the concert all the way till sunday and then we come back on monday um we only did it live the opening of the movie is live during stagecoach which happens two weeks later right before willie nelson came on so there was forty thousand people in the crowd bradley comes out he does the opening scene um the opening song and uh, and that's the audience. And if you really look close enough, some of the audience is, you know, a little confused at what's happening because they've been there all day drinking and all of a sudden Bradley Cooper's out. And by the way, when he's singing, he's singing live, but we're not projecting it to the audience. We're trying to keep all the music secret, right? Because this is two oh. years before the movie comes out. We have Lady Gaga. We have Bradley Cooper singing live. And if you project it through speakers then the whole, you know, then, then the whole gig is up. Everybody hears it. So only the really? people in the first row or two can actually hear him singing the rest of it just because they're close to his voice. Wow. Okay. And that's also why you do the impulse response so that you can blast it out to the audience and make it sound like in the theater, make it sound like it was going wide. So you did the impulse response then when the audience was there or when no one, we did it, there? we did it without the audience. Yeah. Okay. We were you. able to do it throughout the week. So that was like a certain stage that we just, you know, were Damn. able to do. Yeah. So everyone was there at that stage to see Willie Nelson and suddenly Bradley Cooper and Lady <laughs> yeah. Gaga come out and they, they see they're singing, but they can't really hear them. Unless yeah, well, it's just, it's just Bradley Cooper at that point. Okay. Uh, right. And then we also did the same thing at Glastonbury in London, uh, you know, and that was in front of 120,000 people. Wow. But you can't, you know, it's hard to get like, just like with anything, if you do it all CGI, it just looks fake. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like we can jump out in front of, you know, a, a band because they have a 10 minute, uh, changeover from one band to another okay. and they give us you know three or four minutes of it and we run out there and we plug everything in real quick and we hit play and we have a little pro tools you know on my laptop that i've given a cable to the front of house guy and you know and he plays it through the wedge in front of bradley and that's it nothing out you know we tell him don't put his microphone out but give me the feed and i take the feed and we hit record and go go you know we're yelling and yeah i mean it's pure chaos it looks like we are absolute it kind of looks like we're a bunch of idiots, but we're running around. <laughs> so you're you're working with the front of house engineer that was there doing the yeah because he would show. have like yeah he, he was on the side of the stage and I'm like hey I need a feed from that microphone he goes here you go and I just grab it plug it in great and then here's the feed of the playback and I hand it to him and so he, and I said just play it through that wedge speaker right in front of him not out through the house okay great but he's gonna say a speech real quick to the crowd can you put that out the speakers you got it you know and then that was it wow. <laughs> 
That is so cool. So was so the audience was just sort of confused, but were they kind of into it or? Yeah, they were kind of into it because like, well, for Glastonbury, what we learned, we learned the lesson from um, Stagecoach, which was the opening of the movie. Glastonbury was the very last thing we filmed, really. Okay. And we learned the lesson that if the audience doesn't hear anything, they're not reacting to anything. So we had a, in one of the songs, he has a guitar solo, which doesn't give away any song at all. Like, there's, you know, so uh-huh. we just said to the front of the house, I said, when I, when I point to you, bring the guitar up through the speakers. And he's like, okay, cool. You know, and so here comes a guitar solo, point to the guy, he brings it up. And there's Bradley Cooper, you know, even though he's just playing, he's pretending to play the guitar, the audience doesn't know. And so they're freaking out because Bradley Cooper's rocking out on this electric guitar. Uh, okay. Oh, so you're, you have a pre recorded by a guitar player. We have pre recorded everything. Yeah. And he's pretending to play. Exactly. And the audience thinks he's actually playing. Yep. And that's the only part that's up. That's, yeah. that is chaos. And you never it, know it. I'm, yeah. yeah. I, that's that's really fascinating. Yeah, and that's how you get those big crowds. You know, the look of the huge crowds. You have to shoot it in front of crowds. You know? And you only get that one chance, whatever that little ten minute or whatever oh, yeah. five minute. We were supposed to get ten to get minutes, right. and we had three songs to do. And we show up, and they said, "Hey, we're running long. You guys have three minutes." And Bradley went, "Well, oh, okay, great, got it." And we all flew out there. I mean, it was like four of us that just flew out to Glastonbury just for this, right? And it's all of a sudden like you have a third of the time. And he goes, "Well, I guess we're only doing one song." And I said, "Well." you only need what, like 30, 40 seconds of each song. Yeah. I said, let's just do 30, 40 seconds of each song. We'll just go one song at a time. We'll just play it through and then you'll have all three. All right. Yeah. Let's do that. And so we would, you know, it was like play 30 seconds. Okay. Next song, you know, hit the button. (laughs) It's chaos. It was chaos, but it was fun. And also like Lars of uh, Metallica, right? Lars. Uh He was one of the camera operators. Bradley was like, Lars, you're my buddy here. Grab this camera and follow me out on stage. You know, because we had a we had a camera crew, but we only had an operator for one camera, and we had two cameras there. And so Bradley's like, "Hey, we got an extra camera. Lars, come on, you operate this camera." Because <laughs> he just happened to be standing there. Watching. He just happened to be there. Yeah. <laughs> did you run into any problems? When you, I mean, other than that problem of oh, it's only three minutes. Did it go as smooth as it could go? Were there any hiccups that popped up? I mean, it went as smooth as it could go. We got a taxi cab from. Bath, England to Glastonbury, which is, you know, 45 minute drive. And our taxi cab driver is going to stay there all day. He doesn't know what's going on. He's just been hired for the day. Mm-hmm. And I'm with the the studio executive and myself, uh, his wife and my wife. We all, the four of us came together and all my gears in the back of his taxi cab. So I was like, all right, we're going to go scout. You know, we have to go check in at the various departments at Glastonbury, make sure that we're all good. We check in, we go to the stage, we understand, we come back to the cab and the cab is locked the cab driver is gone and we're like what is happening there's a, there's two hundred thousand people here where is this guy and he is gone for the next hour and a half we had 10 minutes before we had to be on stage and i looked at the producer said i think i'm gonna have to break this guy's window he goes yeah yeah give him another minute and then yeah let's just break the window and let's grab the gear and uh sure enough within like 30 seconds the guy shows up we're like dude where have you been open your car. I need my gear. Let's go. <laughs> that was the only real hiccup, but that was one of those things. It's like, uh, okay. I mean, our option is to break this guy's window beyond that. We'll be fine. Wow. Yeah. But we didn't have to. So that was good. Well, that's cool. That yep. is very, very cool. Um, do, uh, so you said like a lot of times when you're doing musicals, um, the, the dead giveaway, when you, you said you're adding the, like the ambience is at the beginning and the end. So it's like transitioning from having like, People talking with ambience to a recorded, to a, yeah, studio. that's to a full blown okay. music playback, right? So once they're in the middle of the song, you'll just kind of shift over to the studio one, and the audience won't even notice that you've done that. Well, the p- post production will do that. So okay. my job on set will be record them live the entire time. Um, we did a movie called, um, uh, was it The Prom? And The Prom was a hundred percent music playback is you know they would talk 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 and playback and they would they would sing it right okay and and post-production did an amazing job blending it to the point where it's like it's really well done and you don't really hear a huge difference in the playback versus the live but that was a scenario where we would have loved to get the first you know line of the song at least live on set and then go straight in the playback and get the last line so that they could do the blend but our director, he was like, no, nope, don't want to do it. Don't need to, you know, and he had done tons of musicals and he was comfortable with the way that that sounded. 
So that was how he wanted to do it, which was totally fine. I mean, that's, that's always a director's choice. Um, our job is just to give them options. Here's your options. Here's what, okay. and, and a lot of the time the directors go, I don't know anything about sound. What should I do? You know, and you go, okay. well, here's your options. You know, do you want it to sound like straight playback musical, you know, fantasy moment where it doesn't really matter? Or do you want it to sound more real? And we just happen to capture the performance. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it just depends on the movie, you know, like a star is okay. born. You had to do it live. Right. Otherwise okay. it's just yeah. like, oof, that's cheesy, you know? And then a movie like, you know, the prom it's fantasy. It's, it's, you know, the lighting's changes, everything goes to rainbows. I mean, it's great, but it's not based in reality. So it doesn't really matter as much. Okay. Another one of those context, what the audience yeah, is Yeah. In the context. Things. Yeah. It's like, if it's totally ridiculous, it's fine. You know, it's fine to be ridiculous. <laughs> So now you said sometimes a director will be really open because they're not sure what to do. Do you ever run into a situation where a director or someone feels very strong about how it should be done and you know it's going to be a major problem if you do it that way? Um, yeah. I mean, you have you have certain discussions. It's like, no, that's not, you know, it's like you definitely know what works and what doesn't. Um, but your goal is always to give the director what he wants. Right. But also understand why he's asking the question that he's asking or whoever's asking that question. You just go, okay, hold on. Let me, let me think about this. You know, okay. So you want this, this, and this to happen, you know, and sometimes they don't realize that what they're asking for uh, okay. is the wrong on the technical side, the wrong thing. And so it's kind of your job to say, well, technically here's the reason why we do it this way, you know? Okay. Um, but you could definitely have personalities where they just don't want to talk to you at all. And you just go, okay, you know, it's your movie. You know, and you write right. notes and you call the editor and you say, here's what's going on. And, you know, there, there's almost nothing you can do at that point. You just go, that's, I, you know, right. I'm a, you know, 95% of the time I'm a technical position. You know, there's only 5% of the time where I get to be artistic and, and make choices that will affect the product. The rest of the time, I'm just kind of following what they want to do and make sure that I'm doing it on a technical level correctly. Okay. All right. Do, um, are there certain habits of actors maybe the way they speak or the way they move that make them some harder to record than others? Oh, for sure. Like the newest, the the latest, you know, acting trend is to whisper and to mumble everything, you know, and back in the day, you know, if you wanted to be heard as an actor, you came from theater and you would speak and you would, you know, pronunciate. Now it's like, and it's like, what did he just say? And it's your job. And, and you'll have a microphone like four inches from his mouth and you'll have a, a love on his, you know, on his collar and you're like, you're mixing between the two just to get some semblance of what did he say? Okay, great. <laughs> and so it's, it's also very difficult because if you're sitting there reading the script while he's talking, you understand exactly what he's saying or he or she is saying. But if you listen to it without that knowledge of what they're saying, and sometimes I try to do that where I just go, okay, you know, I'm not going to follow along with what he's saying. I'm going to listen and see if I can understand what he's saying. Because the director knows the script, the script supervisor knows the script, everybody knows what he's saying. And so our minds will fill that gap. So it's my job to say, oh, did you really understand what oh. he's saying there? It's a little unclear to me. And sometimes they'll just say, yeah, yeah, no, I totally get it. And I go, okay. And then I walk away and I sit back down, you know? And sometimes if they understand what I'm saying, I'm like, mm, it's a little unclear. Then they'll say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to have them speak up a little bit, you know? And then they'll say, hey, can you speak up? And, and that, that helps out that. Oh, wow. So you'll, there'll be times where you're live, like you're live mixing between an overhead mic and a, a lavalier oh, mic, sure. like yeah. in the moment. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like most of the, tra so on set, if you think about like, I don't know if you've ever watched like a, a gold mining show where they pull like thousands of yards of dirt to get a little teeny nugget, right? And uh -huh. the teeny nugget is what they're after. Well, my job is that thousand yards of dirt. I'm trying to get as much audio is possible so i'll run 8 12 20 30 tracks of audio which is individual microphones on people on boom poles planted microphones everything on set and i'll record it everybody gets their own channel every 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 single microphone is recorded on its own thing and then i'll be mixing now if i screw up a mix it's okay the only people that are hearing that are the director and everybody on set and the editor who has to deal with it later but they have the individual tracks God. You know, so we have multi-tracks so they can just pick it up or grab it and pop it in if I screw it up. So my job mixing is for one to make the dailies, which is what the studio and the director and the editor edit with and, and listen to make that sound good. But also it allows me as the recordist to understand, oh, okay, everything is good or those mics all sound good. 
Because if I just put every fader up, who knows what's happening, right? You, somebody scratches their their shirt while somebody else is talking. It's totally fine because that's not on the guy who's talking's mic. But if you Got hear it. it and you're not sure what that is, so that's why you live mix as you go uh, uh, on the production side. And so okay. I'll do bonus things like, oh, that's that that creaky door is really cool. Like on the color purple, we have like this really cool, you know, hinge door that has this really creaky like spring on it and nobody ever talked while it was happening but man it sounded cool so we just put a mic right on it and we would record it every single scene if somebody come in come out you know it's like it's there now whether post-production uses it sifts through it and finds that little nugget of gold that's up to them you know they may have the perfect creaky swinging door that they just like to use and so that's their that's their you know choice i just my my goal is to give them as much information as possible overload them with with tracks and then they can sift through it and find find the little nuggets got it so the live mixing is more for the people hearing it now and like the dailies for people to review yep. but but the guys that are actually gonna be mixing it later down the road they get every raw track yes absolutely okay. and let me, let me okay. be clear like tv uh a lot of the times they'll use your mix like if your mix is good they'll use it right because why okay. why remix something that sounds perfectly good uh, TV has a shorter post-production schedule. They're week to week. They're really fast. So sometimes they don't have time to remix the entire thing. Motion pictures, they're going to remix everything you've done because they have months and time to do it. Um, okay. one director, Jason Reitman, him and I have done a few movies together, like you know, a dozen or so. And he's a guy that whatever I give him on set, it's only going to change 10% in post. Like his post people and I, we all talk and it's like, whatever I end up giving him in that editing room is what he's going to stick to. And if they try to clean it or fix it too much, he, it bothers him. And he goes, no, no, that's not what it is. Huh. Let's just, let's just listen to the, to the set track, you know, and that's, what that's he goes so, so you have to be careful in what you give or don't give, uh, depending on the director. Oh, got it. So, well, sometimes you have some tracks, like you said, you have a bunch of mics. Well, sometimes you'll just be like, eh, I'm not even going to give them this one. This one's useless or, oh, or you totally. just have a sense for what they will need and won't need. Yeah. Like, well, on Color Purple, there was all these like, you know, antique cars, like old school cars from the 20s. Right. And the, the movie set mm-hmm. back then. And so we put mics on all the cars that they're driving around. But I'm just tracking that. I'm not even going to put it in the mix because my my focus is the dialogue. So I, I make sure that the microphones sound good. They're at a good level. I can see them moving while the scene is happening. But I'm not putting them in the mix because my goal is dialogue. But the bonus material that I'm giving post is these cars. Whether they use uh, them or not, their choice, right? Okay. But Do if you I don't like, give it to them, then they don't have the option of using it. Right. Do you accompany like when you when you give all that stuff to post? Do you have like notes that you give them, just like oh, yes. hey, watch out for this, or I recommend this, or anything like that? Just thoughts. Yeah, it's as not you go. so much a recommendation. It's more like you know, it's a you know, scene eighty two Apple or scene eighty two A has these twelve tracks. Here's what's on track one, two, three, four, five, all the way through twelve. Okay. And then okay. if there's an obvious like you know, an airplane flew over during the take and they moved on, I'll write airplane director was aware. You know, just say hey, you know. There was an airplane on that one. That's okay. We're moving on. Okay. okay. And he just put it down as a note saying, you know, director was aware that there was an airplane and then you send it off. I don't necessarily say, Hey, I think that this is good for this track and this is good for that. Cause uh, there's a script supervisor who is next to the director and they're watching the scene and he goes, Ooh, I like, I like the opening two lines from this take. And I like the other two lines from this take. And so that's what the editor will go through her notes her, her okay. him notes and, and go, Oh, that's the, you know, here's what the director was thinking and they'll edit it and decide, huh. you know, Do later. You, now, just a quick word from our sponsor, us audible genius. We don't just make a podcast. In fact, our main thing is modern music courses for today's digital musicians. These are super interactive, fun and effective courses that'll give you the skills you need to make music. First, we have Building Blocks, our beat composition course that'll teach you how to compose the building blocks of beats like drum patterns, bass lines, chord progressions, and melodies. You can check that out at audiblegenius.com. And then we have Centorial, our award-winning course that'll teach you how to design sounds with a synthesizer. You can check that out at centorial.com. In both cases, you'll be immersed in software environments where you create sounds and compose beats as you go using the same tools today's musicians actually use. And for this month, you can get 20% off both courses by using coupon code MIXER at checkout. Again, that's audiblegenius.com and centorial.com. Do you find that 
certain mics, like let's say the one attached to the actor's bodies, yeah. do you find that like certain mics, certain positions are used more than any other? Like one's oh. more reliable in getting what you need? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have your tricks. Like if somebody's wearing a tie, next time you watch a TV show with a tie in it, like a TV show, look at the tie knot and you'll see like a quarter inch bump out or a half inch bump from the tie to the fabric. That's not natural. Mm -hmm. When you tie a tie, it's <laughs> against each other. So a lot of sound people will put that bump in there, put the microphone in there and gives them a, a good ah. protection. Now I try to avoid it because when you're doing a movie and that bump is on a 50 foot screen, all of a sudden it's a five foot bump, you know, and it's very okay. obvious what you, what you've done. Um, so there's other techniques of doing it uh, where you don't see that bump and that's what we go with. But that's like, you know, there are definitely things that work and definitely things that don't work. You know, you've tried like the collar of a, of a shirt, you know, put it in the collar and it's like, no, that just doesn't work well. I hear it, but then you get the skin scraping against the fabric mm -hmm. or if they have a beard, you know, the, 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 the hair scrapes against the beard. Uh, it, it's, you know, you know, what's going to work and what's not. Uh, and so huh. you, you definitely have things like button up shirts that are tight, brutal, brutal to work with, you know, cause it's just like really? the fabric is stiff. It's against their body and any, any kind of movement that they do is just like a scratch. You know, and so it's like, yeah, you know what's going to work and what's not after after you've done it long enough, and and, and okay. you have your tricks. Yeah. What if they're not wearing a shirt? What if it's a shirtless scene? So, <laughs> we had a scene. <laughs> well, we've done it all. We had the scene in Babysitter Two, where the main character, one of the main characters, is shirtless the entire movie. You know, <laughs> and uh, so what we would do ninety percent of the time is wait for his close up to get a mic in there. But if we had, we had to mic him a few times because there was this giant wide and he's yelling for the girl, come out, come out, you know, and he's like shirtless. And we put it in his belt buckle, the lav really? in his belt buckle, which was like, there's no way this is going to work, but it's the only place we can put it. And he was game for it. We're like, you know, miking his crotch, you know, in his belt buckle. And we're like, all right. And he was totally fine with it. He's a good, he's a good guy, a nice actor. And uh, it sounded great. I mean, for the wide shots, it sounded amazing. It sounded like we had a mic pretty close to him, which we did. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. But when you have those things where it's like they're shirtless, then that's when you have a nice conversation with the cinematographer saying, hey, this guy doesn't have a shirt. We can't mic him. Can you make sure not to shoot? Because so sometimes what they'll do with two cameras is they'll shoot a super uh, wide shot and they'll zoom in on a couple actors to get their coverage. And it's like, hey, can you not shoot? close up at the same time you shoot the wide shot on the guy without a shirt because we can't get a mic on him and you know what 90 percent of the time they go i psh, totally get it understand and sometimes they okay. go sorry dude you're screwed nothing i can do we're behind schedule we have to shoot it and he's going okay you know and then that's what you do <laughs> you know you just do your best yeah yeah it sounds like you have to have this perfect balance in your personality of advocating but also being flexible like being a you, stickler and being flexible at the same yeah, time yeah i mean you have to be able to get it good but also understand that on a film set if there's 200 people there's three of us for the audio and there's you know 297 other people for just the visual costumes wow. locations wow. you know makeup hair lighting everything is for the visual there's three huh. of us for the sound in wow. post-production it flips right there's a colorist and a color timing person for the video or for the, for the visual, but then there's like 150 people for sound. Right. So it's like it flips okay. in post, but that's the thing like on set is there's just a small amount of us that have to protect the audio and everybody else who they're not against you. It's just, they're trying to do their, their art. And if okay. you're in their way, you get run over. So there's a way of like, you know, it's that simple thing. If you just treat people with kindness, they'll help you when they can. Whereas okay. if you go in there and say, we need it this way and X, Y, and Z, it's like, yeah, okay, maybe that works, but they're not really going to help you in the, in the long run, you know? Okay. So it's like, they know the audio is important, but they can't help, but put all their focus on the visual. Cause that's just the people yeah, there are doing that's that. their okay. thing. And, the, and, and some cinematographers are super like, they get it. They know what we're doing. So they'll help us out with, with easier okay. lighting. And, you know, cause sometimes you'll have a perfect scene where you want to boom somebody, but you know, the shadows in the way because of the lighting okay and there's some so you know like everything everything is against you not in and not in the on purpose way but you know production sound is one of those things it's like you're not in the studio and it's not about you you know hmm. you're just yeah. you're just like run over sometimes that's interesting yeah what I, 
I remember you told me once that one of the tougher films getting sound was uh, Up in the Air that took place at yep. an airport. Yep. What was what's so difficult about an airport? Just the constant background noise? Yes, yeah, the background noise. There's jets taking off every you know minute or two. Okay. Um, because anytime you have a scene where you're filming one person, then you turn around and you film another person, you cut back and forth. The ambience is what changes. What's the obvious difference. Okay. Um, and so they have to blend that, or you have to make sure that you're covered. You know, you're, you'll be recording a scene and you go, okay, take two had a line, you know, had an airplane on this line, you know? And so you have to think about it like, oh, but we have four other takes where that line is perfectly good, you know? And so you just have to always check in with the director and make sure that he understands like on take two, these three lines are terrible. Like you're not going to want to use them. Oh, and, right. And he'll okay. understand, you know? Got it. Because when, so when they're shooting, let's shoot a scene, like let's say a conversation between two people yeah. five, six times. And then later on, the editor might, might take, okay, line one from this, this take line two from that take. They'll kind of piece oh, yeah. it together. Yeah. And, yeah. It's so, not just one take going back and forth. It's like, you know, got it. Yeah, it's all over the place. And and, and sometimes it'll be a visual from one take and an audio from a different take onto the same, you know, so it's like right, okay. there's full on editing all over the place. Yeah. Got it. So you can't say like have a, like a, a suddenly there can't be the sound of an airplane taking off, like cutting halfway into the sound of an airplane take off when they switch to take two for the answer. Right, exactly. You have then to all keep it consistent. Like, oh, shit. You know, but what you can do if say the director's like, oh, my God, I love take two and, and, and that the airplane's killing me. What post-production will do is they'll add an airplane prior to that edit in to uh, blend and to fix it. So then there's that, that way, there is that way to fix it. And you just go, okay, okay, well, now there's an airplane through the whole scene, which is fine. Because in this moment, we need that airplane to match in that moment. Got so they it. can and fix those things. And you're in an airport okay. and it makes sense. And contextually to the audience, airplane, airport, got it. Yeah, it sounds like it's such a fascinating puzzle and it's got to work between you doing the live and the yeah. post guys down the, well, down the yeah, road. I mean, if you think of like, you know, any podcast or like NPR report, right, where they go on location and they're like, we're here at the airport. It's like you hear like, you know, eight, day eight, two, uh, da, 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 you know, and they have all the ambience going and it's to set your mind to understand, oh, now I'm at the airport. But it's just a even though it's not even a visual thing, it's an audio thing. And they're setting the, and, and I bet you 90% of the time, that's just an edited in sound effect of an airport. They didn't go to the airport and just happened to catch okay. the perfect ambience, right? But they're right. doing that to set the story. And the same thing happens with the visual. If the visual and the audio match, totally fine. You know, it's like, oh, huh. we hear airplanes. We're at an airport. Got it. You know, the audience is cool with that. But you're at like the Getty Museum and it's a beautiful day. And all of a sudden you just have a you know helicopter flying over randomly that has nothing to do with the story. The audience is going to go, why did that helicopter fly over? You know, because right. <laughs> because you're only putting things in movies that that tell the grander story. OK, you know, yeah. and if it doesn't mean anything like you'll watch a movie, and you'll go, wait, why did that just happen? And sometimes it never gets cleared up and it's confusing to the audience because we're all used to being told information in a movie like here's what you need to know as an audience member to enjoy this movie. And if there's something in there that doesn't make any sense or doesn't fit in anywhere, you go, wait, what? Why did that happen? Do you find that stuff's usually obvious? Like Getty example is obvious. We're at a peaceful scene at a museum. A helicopter shouldn't be in there. But right. are there sometimes subtle background noises that wouldn't seem like they'd be a big deal until later in context? It's like, oh, that's so weird. Like, is it is it always easy to catch those wrong things? It's, it's always easy to catch the wrong things because your brain, at least okay. my brain, goes, uh-uh, something's wrong. You know, like, change that. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think it's pretty easy to, to figure out because you, we'll all, we all do it. We watch a movie and go, oh, that was weird. Something's not yeah. quite right, you know. Oh, okay, uh, that's fair. Oh, yeah, if all yeah. the audience is going to do it naturally, then so will you. Yeah, exactly oh. right. Yeah. Okay. And a lot you of also time, did... they'll fix it, so. Okay. Yeah. Can they just, in post, if push comes to shove, can they just somehow kind of, like, I know there's like audio processing tools in music, but they, can they say like, we have to get rid of this airplane sound. There's no other way to do it. Do they have tools that they can just like kind of cut it out of the audio oh, in a yeah. sense. Yeah. There's okay. some great, there's some great noise reduction tools. Um, yeah. I mean, there's just a ton of tools for cleaning audio, cleaning uh, scratches, cleaning ticks, cleaning, you know, okay. RF interference, yeah. like, because the real world is rough on sound, mm -hmm. right? The real world is tough. You you have an actor who's talking all of a sudden somebody, you know, some police walkie or some emergency channel turns on that hasn't been on in weeks and just scrambles the take, you know, and you're just like, what, what was that? And you have to change frequencies and 
like you know because the little transmitters that are on the actors are you know 30 milliwatts they're teeny tiny you know compared to everything else around you so it's like yeah i mean everything so post production's gotten very good um at cleaning you know okay. rxing you know all that all that audio and it's the same stuff for the music industry as well it's just you're just cleaning processing yeah. the the information yeah oh huh, cool now you did the most recent fast and furious movie fast x ish i did, did that, the la portion okay okay did that pose any unique like just it being so car oriented does doing something with a lot of cars pose unique challenges cars are a pain in the butt to be honest like you have yeah. a scenario where now you're like 90 percent visual like 99 percent okay. visual who cares about the sound so um and there's all the different tricks in the cars and you know they're noisy and things like that so it's like we had the scene where they're doing like you know donuts in the the dodger stadium parking lot okay. and we could do the normal thing which is well i'm in charge of dialogue so i'll put a mic on an actor and that's all i'm gonna do you know but to me i thought well that's a little boring let's let's try to amp it up we have nothing else to do the guy's not talking in the car he's just doing donuts so let's try okay. to record the engine and the car sound right so we put two microphones uh -huh. at the back of the car you know but they're little lavaliers because you can't you know, in a grand world, you'd have big microphones and everything going, but we're filming at the same time. So we have to hide them all. So we put okay. a portable recorder in the car. We wire up two microphones into, you know, from the back bumper, which is going to get the, the sound of the screeching tires and the exhaust. And then we put a microphone in the engine compartment to get the, the revving and the, the different sounds of the engine. And then you have to know, okay, this is all super loud stuff. So you got to crank it down before you hit record and let them go. And we did, and we recorded it and it, and it's like, it's a really cool sound, you know, but there's also, by the way, 10 other Fast and Furious movies that have pre-recorded engine sounds and sound effects. And okay. there's an entire guy that that's what he does, right? The, the, the sound effects editor. So it's not like he's just going to take our tracks and go, oh, these are perfect. Cut, paste, done. You know, so he'll probably look at ours and go, okay, good reference. Let me re, re, you know, let me find these sounds somewhere else. Oh, got it. Okay. I was going to, yeah. I was wondering that, like how much of that, of the sounds in a movie like that are the actual ones recorded on set and how much are just cut in? Probably very fact? little, probably very little. Like we did Jason Bourne, the Las Vegas strip chase scene, right? In that movie. Okay. And we shut down the Vegas strip for like six weeks every night from 8 PM until six in the morning at wow. one mile at a time. And we would just do the chase through the whole thing. And there was two sound guys. It was me and, and my buddy, Rich. We recorded everything. We we put mics in places you shouldn't put mics because basically there was no actors, right? It was all stunt people, and they're going to crash cars. And so we're like, let's put a recorder in that car that's going to got to get you know it's going to get t boned. Let's hear how that sounds, you know. It's like uh -huh. so we recorded all this cool stuff, and it sounds amazing, right? All these cars flipping and crashing. One car actually flipped by accident, and we just kind of opened the trunk. We're like, yeah, it's still in there, and we grabbed it. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so it was just one of those things where we're like, ah, it still works. All right, perfect. And then you watch the movie and you're like, nah, none of that made it. They didn't use one ounce of our sound. <laughs> like we were there for six weeks for nothing, just collecting a paycheck. But it was fun, <laughs> you know. But that's the thing. I mean, it's like post production. That's their job. Their job is to, you know, because the way right. the movie is, the way the movie is played in America, they're going to play the original tracks, right? But in France, they're going to dub it in French. And if they don't have all those sound effects and all the music all, all you know, stemmed out by themselves, oh. not connected to the American voices, then the movie changes drastically in a different country. So Got really it. our main job is that, you know, the American version of the dialogue and any sound effects that we get, they'll use, but they'll clip them out and they put them in a, you know, in a different track. Because if they play with our track, then it gets wiped out in any foreign version. So it really is their job to make sure everything is completely isolated, separated and new sound effects or else, you know, you mute the American voice and all your sound effects go away. Wouldn't work. Oh, wow. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. So yeah. you don't, you don't take that personally, of course, it's just oh, the way God. it is. And uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, our job right. is the dialogue, you know, right. I mean, I just find it funny because it's like, oh, right. we're, all right, we were there for, you know, <laughs> we also did the same thing for transformers. We went, uh, to Peru and we filmed for 10 days transformer the stunt unit and we showed up and we're like all right so how many actors we got and they're like no no actors just the cars okay just the cars driving down the hill yep 
big chase scene. Okay, cool. All right. So the first day we're running around, I'm putting time code in the cameras so that they don't have to hit the slate. It'll just automatically be sunk up with time code with our recording. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, to make everything as easy as possible for post-production. And uh, we mic the cars and we're doing all this stuff and we're chasing it and we're at like 14,000 feet, barely have any oxygen, but we're doing all this fun stuff. Right. Let, let's just enjoy it. And so we hit record, we bring it down, we're done with the day, bring it over to the the DIT, the digital imaging tech. Now they're the person that takes all the footage and puts it all together with the sound and spits it out and puts it to um, the editor. And she goes, oh, none of your time goes working. I was like, really? Well, that's weird because we checked it. She's like, well, we're shooting at 22 frames. Now, normal shooting is 24 frames. So when they shoot at 22 frames, it basically mutes the time code track which makes every all the action seem that much faster, you know, 10% faster, okay. uh-huh. which makes it seem really fun and exciting, but they can't sync up the sound and there's no point because it would be out of sync anyway. Even if they sunk it up at the beginning of the take, it'd be out of sync by the end of the take. So then we sat there and we're like, okay, are we going to be doing 22 frames the entire 10 days? They're like, yep. Okay. Well, uh, hmm, let's change our strategy. Let's just mic the cars. So we just, we, every day we would pick, okay, here's the, the Porsche today. We'll mic the Porsche, get a stunt driver to drive it up and down the mountain once. And, you know, fast, you know, he's a stunt driver. He's going to do his fast. And then that'll be our recording. And then, then we'll come back the next day. Okay. The next day, let's get the, you know, the tow truck driving up and down <laughs> the mountain once. I mean, it's like, we were there for 10 days. Who knows how much of it, any of it they used because it's at this point now it's just wild track of these cars that they've already recorded from <laughs> seven other movies. So when you're deciding, you must have a lot of gear, right? It's just way more than any human should have. <laughs> yeah. It's, so it's an embarrassment. <laughs> do you know exactly what gear you're going to need before a shoot or do you just have to bring a lot for like a just in case kind of thing? Uh, it depends on the movie, but like for the Peru movie, I knew what I needed. Um, I knew we were going to be mobile. You know, you kind of talk to the producer or the production manager and say, you know, what, what are we shooting? Okay, great. Um, and then, and then you go with it that way. Um, so you, you generally know I had one case with me with a bunch of stuff in it. Um, okay. but you know, for like a musical, if we're doing a musical, we bring everything. The entire truck is loaded with stuff. Really? Uh, for a musical a huh? amount for music. Musicals are the hardest. Right, because you're recording everything and and you're playing back and you have earpieces and you have speakers and thumpers and all sorts of uh, extra Pro Tools rig and all sorts of stuff that you're doing on set that you don't normally Right. Do. It's because of the music part adding a whole yeah, other music layer part. of complexity. And also, like while you're filming the movie, sometimes they'll say, Hey, this song needs to be, you know, one verse longer. This song needs to be, you know, give me eight more seconds in this moment for this lighting cue. Cause I need to get the camera from that door to this door and the song is too short. And it's not like you can go, no, the song is what it is. Just figure out your shot. You go, okay, eight more seconds. Got it. And then you have a music editor sitting next to you and he'll sit there and blah, 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 dink. there it is. What do you think? Yep. That's, that'll work. And then you move on. Wow. You know, and then everything now, gets edited in post and that'll change again in editing. You know, the song changes and shortens or speeds up or <laughs> you know, depending on the, huh. depending on the edit. You once told me that sometimes there'll be multiple people like during a music, during a music scene, there'll be multiple people on screen, but they may not, and they all have like in-ear monitors, but they may not all be hearing the same thing. Like you'll give different actors or dancers different audio. Yeah. How So how does that work? Why, why would they not all be hearing the same thing if they're all working with the same song? Okay. So a movie Babylon, uh, Margot Robbie in the opening, you know, big number, the, the I guess the big uh, party scene. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a, there's a 1920s jazz band ish kind of thing on, or big band kind of thing on the stage and it's a big party. And she's supposed to have this like epiphany moment where she's just like, you know, the center of attention. Well, we have professional dancers that have, you know, choreographed an entire routine because the camera is very fluid. So it has to go through the crowd and there's specific things that the camera sees. And so you have to, you know, it can't just be random dancers in the corner, you know, they're going for it. And then we also pull in Margot Robbie who, you know, is listening to, she wanted to hear a different song because she doesn't want to dance to the same beat that the dancers are dancing to and that the party's dancing to. She's her own, you know, she's, she's dancing to her own rhythm in the movie. So the dancers get one song, she gets a different one. And then that, that's how you create this like, 
she's just on top of the world dancing to her own beat versus you know God. being the same person in the crowd and the way you do that is you know you have different you know just like in ears you have different channels of of earpieces that everybody's hearing one thing and then she's hearing her own thing so she has her own channel um huh so how do you hide the earpieces or you know the ones that are actually in the ear yeah so the earpieces are the size of a peanut and they fit oh. in the ear canal there's no wires coming out there's no nothing there's a battery receiver the whole thing is in there wow. um, and then what we also found out through doing it over the years is they have tan and a brown color and to be honest, no matter what skin tone you are, your ear hole is dark, right? It just, it's not weird and tan. It's just dark. Uh -huh. So if you use the brown um, uh, color earpiece and you put it in your ear, it just hides. It, it's invisible. Um, oh. And then also with women, sometimes their hair goes over their ears so you don't see it. Um, you have to also change it from shot to shot. You know, if the camera's on one side of your head, you put the earpiece in the other side. When the camera turns around, you have the actor switch it to the other side. Um, so you're trying uh -huh. to hide it as much as you can. And then in those moments when it's very obvious, there's an earpiece in their ear, visual effects takes over and paints it out, okay. but that's expensive. Okay. So you always try to avoid it, but you cue in the visual effects people on set. You say, Hey, by the way, they're wearing an earpiece. It's in this ear. Here you go. And they go, okay, great. And they mark it down. And then in editing, if they see it, they go, okay, they could just erase it pretty quick. That's crazy that everything is in the size of a peanut. Because my experience with in-ear monitors is playing live on stage. You know, it's a very visible thing in my ear. It wraps around my ear, and there's a wire going down to my waist where all that other stuff is like a, you know, like a little box. But all of that is just inside that little peanut-shaped monitor. Yeah, and that's also why it sounds like it sounds. I mean, it's not like, it's not horrible sounding. You can definitely hear the music, but it okay. only goes to a certain volume. You know, like... um like Lady Gaga likes her earpiece at top volume, whereas like okay. Joaquin Phoenix uh, likes his at the very lowest volume. Huh. And so each each one is individually, you know, you can tune each one to different volumes uh, so they're not blowing out each other's ears or making somebody can't hear it versus somebody can only hear it. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, they sound slightly worse than FM radio, right? Better than AM, worse than FM. Okay. Um, and and that's... And, that's just what it is. But it's because you don't want all the wires and all the stuff hanging off actors because, right. you know, visually it just, it's not, it doesn't work. Yeah. It takes the viewer out of the movie, right? It's like, Oh, exactly. this is a movie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like there's a big earpiece and now you have the VFX their entire half their head. You know, it's like, it doesn't make all sense. Right. Have you ever found yourself in a movie doing a, a job and you're, you feel like you're way in over your head. You're like, Whoa, this is something unfamiliar or do you always feel like it's something you can reach that's close to what you've done before? I mean, no. I mean, there's definitely times where you're just like, holy crap, how am I going to do this? You know, how am I going to do this? <laughs> I, I did uh, the Leonard Bernstein movie called Maestro that's coming out um, in the fall. That was overwhelming because I had never recorded a live orchestra. There was a whole, we did the London Symphony Orchestra, uh, the LSO, and we also did the L London um uh, choir london like you know symphony choir um all at the same time it's a historical you know recording and we did it at a uh, at a cathedral like a 400 year old cathedral um and we recorded it live while he's conducting you know and it's just really? this this just the most amazing recording but you know i had like three or four years to think about how are we going to record it how does he want to do it What's he going to hear? And it just becomes like, yeah, it becomes like, you know, and also, by the way, things can change very quickly on set and you have to just be able to change with it. It's like, yeah, you've, you've made a plan, but you know, the director wants something different in that moment. You have to change. Uh, Is there Bradley, Bradley Cooper often changes on the moment because he'll see something or he'll notice something and he'll go, oh, this is going to be better if it's this way. And then that's okay, when we right. change gears, and that's 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 how you you have to adjust. So in Maestro, you're recording a full symphony performing. Yeah, sixty two tracks of sixty two microphones, and you have to record a symphony in the way that a symphony is recorded, and you also have to record, you know, Dolby Atmos, uh, you know, microphones and other microphones that will work well in the theater, so that you don't just feel like you're listening to an orchestra out of you know a stereo recording you want to hear full dolby atmos recording of a of a symphony 
And are you also recording dialogue in these scenes or is it pure music? Uh, there's dialogue also like at the end of the, the orchestra, he'll run off stage and talk to somebody real quick. And so you're also recording the, the dialogue at the same in the same take. OK, because I was wondering, like, you know, they record symphonies for you know music recordings all the time. I would have just assumed they would have gotten like some recording engineers that do that for a living. Yeah. And then and had so you what do the we dialogue. Did is, well, we did have. Uh, so we do that, that. I mean, that's a good point. It's not like, hey, OK, Steve, go ahead and record that. It's basically like, OK, Steve, here's what we want to do. And then what we ended up doing is called uh, we called the London Symphony Orchestra's uh, classic sound uh, company in London. Uh And they're the ones that came in. They said, "Okay, here's how we normally record it. We're like, great, let's Uh set that up. And they would set the lines and set all the mics. And then we would say, "Okay." in addition to that, we want Dolby Atmos up here. We want this over here. We want this over here. And then we had like I bring certain microphones of my own. to record, you know, different ambiences and different perspectives, you know, some MS stereo recording microphones, okay. some quadraphonic recording, you know, uh, ambisonic recordings, uh, you name it. Because like I said, you can't, you can only get it live once, you know, if you don't get it, then you're not going to get it again. So okay. we will overdo it and then okay. let them piece it down later. Um, huh. but yeah, no, you, you hire, you bring in people, you talk to them, but you also have to realize, well, you know, being the head of the sound department, the director is going to look at you, not at classic sound. So you have to be able to, to communicate with everybody and have everybody understand what they're doing. So yeah, they need a, a movie minded audio guy running the audio so exactly. they can communicate and you, you know what this needs to be. Right. And, and the, so for the last couple of years, you do the research and go, okay, orchestra recording, you know, here's what we need to do and here's how that's going to work. And then you go, oh shit, there's going to be these huge stands everywhere, you know, cause there's going to be microphones everywhere. You got to talk to the director. Is this something you want? You know, like, Oh, well, that must've so, been fun to, to do that something new, right? Like, was it cool oh, to kind of stretch your mind and explore? It's a total blast to do new things. Um, but it, that was the most stress I think I've been also because you want to do the best job you can um because you know you know the director i did you know stars born with him he's a passionate guy and you want to do the best you can for people that appreciate what you do for a living and so i stressed myself out to the point where i actually got like a a fever blister on my eye and i went i went partially blind in one eye for like four months <laughs> it's all healed now but i went to the doctor and i said i said uh, hey what's going on he goes oh it's stress you, you just have to do something less stressful and i went Okay, well, I'm about to start a Joker 2, the musical with Gaga and Joaquin Phoenix singing, you know, on set live. So I guess I'll figure that out because <laughs> you know, that's like that's the stress. Do you have any tricks or habits to help yourself have just like the the least stressed, most stable state of mind to do your job well? I mean, I, I think to be honest, like, you know, my my wife is a very good She's a very good person. I used to be more stressed and more quick to be annoyed and, and quick to mm-hmm. anger, I think, years ago. And she's she's helped me, like, just be just be mellow, relax. There's nothing. Like, we're not curing cancer here. Like, it's mm-hmm. just a movie at the end of the day. It's for pure entertainment. So, mm-hmm. like, if you're treating people with kindness and you're just, like, you're calm about everything and there's always an answer to everything, um, that's just how I move forward. Like, nothing's going to end your career by one thing. Um, yeah. and so that's it, you know, I mean, you, you obviously can't just show up not knowing what's going on. You have a plan, you make a plan. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, also I just, I try to leave it when I leave work. I don't, you know, I used to, at the beginning of my career, really think about, oh, I could have done this better. I could have done that better. I should have done this. I should have done that. It's like, that still happens from time to time, but for the most part, you try to leave it behind and you come back the next day, just fresh. Yeah. I, I always find that's an interesting mental paradox where if, if you really want to do a good job at something, and you have to, right? Like, this is high stakes. This is a big right. deal. You have to do it well. Inside your mind, you got to be a little more laid back about it. It's sort of funny. Like, you almost have to take it easy in here so that it can be amazing out there. Yeah, exactly. We had, <laughs> I, I mean, that. we had, we had like a that perfect example is we had this uh, piano. So on set, what you really have to do is when you're doing a live piano on set, you have to be able to mute the piano, but still record what they're playing. And so you can, you can do this a bunch of different ways. You can have a digital grand piano which you can tap into audio wise and you can record what they're playing, but it's not coming out of the piano itself. It's basically coming out of um, uh, like a Matty, Matty, you know, connection. And so you're, you're taking the signal 
you're processing it, you're playing it back through an earpiece so they can hear what they're playing. And then they're singing live because you, you have to get the vocals clean of any music. Huh? I know. Well, you're- <laughs> Are and they're playing an acoustic piano, like a they're piano that's sending sound piano. out into space. Okay. Yep. And there's a digital interconnection in there that you actually like pull this this lever out that gets rid of the hammers to not. But when they're hitting the keys, now all of a sudden it becomes a digital piano Got that it. has a MIDI connected to it, and the MIDI is transmitted to us. We use our computer to send back the sound of whatever the you know whatever the plugin is, and then right. they hear it in their earpiece, and then they can sing live while playing the piano. And the piano's not over, you know, because what if the piano's untuned? Sure. What if they don't want to use that part of the piano? What if they want to change the music later? If they have the lyrics clean, the vocals clean, but the piano's not. So in in our movie Joker 2, you know, they had a specific piano because digital grand pianos are kind of like, you know, slick and glossy and nice looking. Well, if you have mm-hmm. a piano in a movie, it's probably not that. So we had uh, we had a company convert the piano to a digital piano from like a wow. classic, you know, cool classic piano. And um, so it was kind of like, it, I, I'm not going to say it's jerry-rigged, but there was, a, there was a moment when, you know, the pianist is playing and Gaga kicks the piano because her character kicks the piano. And when that happens, the, the, the Maddie signal to us went burnt and just freaked out and just kind of stopped playing. And the pianist who is her regular <laughs> piano guy was just like continuing to play. She continued to sing. She didn't hear the music, but she could hear the keys that he's playing. Cause just the physical noise of the, you know, touching of the keys and they just okay. kept it together. And the, the computer went, uh, and like four seconds later, the comp- computer picked back up and continued <laughs> to play the music. And we were just like, Whoa, geez. You know, but that's one of those moments where like, we didn't know she was going to kick the piano. She probably didn't know she was going to kick the piano, but it just messed up the whole signal. So you, what are you going to do? You can't plan for that's that. That's cool. Yeah. So you just let it roll that's off. That's very cool. Just, yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, Steve, I could talk to you for hours about this stuff. It's so fascinating. It, and it's just, it's the same, but different when you compare it to music recording. There's so yes. many parallels, but then it's just also the context is totally different. So I, yeah. I really appreciate you sharing this with us. And uh, I think it's awesome. And to the two people that are still left listening, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that aren't related to either of us. <laughs> oh, well said. Uh, yeah. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Steve. All right. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks for listening to the Audible Genius Podcast. Now, as you listen to these musicians' stories, you may find yourself wanting to make your own music. Or maybe you already can, but you feel the need to brush up on fundamentals, fill in some gaps. Well, I've got some super effective and engaging courses that help aspiring digital musicians find their voice and create music they love. And these courses are more than just a series of videos. They have interactive challenges in a music software environment where you actually create music as you go and get real experience. The first course I recommend is Building Blocks where you'll learn beat composition and music theory in an online music studio. Check it out at audiblegenius.com. We also have Centorial, an award-winning course on synthesis, where you'll learn how to create your own sounds with a synthesizer. Check that out at centorial.com. And both of these courses are designed by yours truly and the team here at Audible Genius. So if you've ever had a desire to make your own music, I highly encourage you to check them out. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you on the next episode.